But we'll turn to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. We're going to begin there in just a moment. Hold on. Really kind of before my lesson, but really as as part of my lesson as well, I express my appreciation to you all for the prayers, the offers of help, and other things, uh, especially over the past month or so as I've been dealing with a lot of uh, back issues. Uh, I told um, my wife, I told my mom yesterday, having lunch with her, I said, I, I've gotten a lot more, I think, appreciation and sympathy for people who go through chronic pain. Um, you know, when, when I can take a, a strong prescription pain medication and it doesn't really seem to affect it that much, it might take the edge off, but, you know, still being able to, to feel it uh, despite that. Um, I, I have hope because I, I think I've got some pretty good lines of, and options for me for treatment, but for some people who don't have that, uh, again, I think I've got a lot more sympathy now um, for how it affects you mentally and how, uh, you know, affects you as far as you, you know, sleep and other, other type of things. But it really means a lot um, knowing that many are praying for me and asking. Uh, I, I appreciate that and, and, and hopefully get a good course of treatment tomorrow. Part of that is um, it's, it's kind of limited me a little bit. I, I've been one who's uh, been in a habit uh, over the past year or so habitually hiking and uh, trying to do on Thursday uh, afternoon and Saturday, trying to get a little bit of a longer hike in, but trying to get about three miles uh, in my neighborhood. And I finally decided, but it, it's obviously very difficult. It, on my left leg, it's hard sometimes just to really straighten it out. And so, um, in, in a bit of just stubbornness, I guess, I said, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start back and just have to deal with it because trying to go out and do some, some of the walks, I'd get, I'd get halfway up my road and it, it was just, it would just hurt so much. I turned back. And I just decided it's, okay, well, I'm, I'm gonna take some time off, we're just gonna do this. And uh, I told Sam and I told a couple of others that it's gotten to where I walk two miles and it'll hurt, and by the third mile, either my nerves tired of me not paying attention to it, uh, or maybe I do something that kind of warms things out, provides a little bit of relief uh, for the time. Uh, and yesterday, I wanted to get in five miles, so I uh, walked uh, four laps at, uh, Garden, around the Gardendale Civic Center, two laps make a mile. And I thought, I can't, I just can't keep walking in a circle right here. I walk around in circles sometimes at work and uh, in other parts of my life. I was like, I just can't keep doing this. Uh, so I said, I, I feel good enough. I think I could go down to the Railroad Park Trail down in Fultondale and did that. And uh, through, through the hike, I was listening to uh, First Kings. And it's, it was rather interesting. Uh, some of the thoughts I really had intended to do uh, a lesson on the prayer of Solomon at the dedication of the temple, and I hope to do a lesson on that in the future. But there were some things that were in this this first part of uh, First Kings that really uh, got in my mind, got me thinking, uh, and I want to share some of those thoughts with you this uh, this evening. And I'm going to start out with what happened in Numbers chapter 21, uh, Numbers chapter 21, uh, where. Uh, Israel is uh, coming uh, out, of, they come out from Egypt, and they're on their way uh, going towards the land of promise. It says they're going around the land of Eden, verse 4, and the people became impatient on the way. And, I mean, there's, there's a timeless uh, statement of, some, you know, of, of humanity. So many times we get impatient when things aren't going according to a schedule that we want or it's not unfolding the way that we want. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food or water, and we loathe this worthless food. Now, this to me, this is kind of an interesting thing because they this isn't the first time they've complained. But in the early times where they complain, God would say, Okay, Moses, go, you know, this water's bitter, uh, go do this, and it'll it'll make the water not poisonous, it'll make it fresh and it'll, it'll take care of the people or bring water out of a rock. And then, um, of course, giving the, uh, the manna from heaven to feed such a large multitude in a place that's not built to sustain that type of population temporarily or permanently. And so he's giving them bread from heaven every morning except for one uh, uh, so that they don't gather on the Sabbath day. 
So God's, God's taking care of their needs along the way, and he's teaching them something along the way. But now they're getting impatient, and notice uh, they're complaining against God and Moses. Why did you bring us up to die in the wilderness? Well, first of all, you know, God and Moses could have answered, I didn't bring you up to die in the wilderness. I brought you up to bring you into a promised land. And, you know, we're in uh, uh, a case where they, they have rejected uh, that, and so some uh, are going to have to wander until they die, until the rest who would go into the promised land. So that's not why I brought you up here. Uh, the, any wandering in the wilderness is on yourselves. There's no food, no water. We loathe this worthless food. And that's, that's a lot of ingratitude there, because what they're complaining against is bread from heaven that is given to them every single morning divinely by God. Now, as you know, parents, could you imagine that there is a gift that you're, you're preparing for your kids, you really think they'll like it, maybe there's some financial sacrifices that you're going through in order to provide this for them, uh, and, and, and you do these things and, and uh, you, you give it to them and, and they, just, they just treat it with disdain. Like, it's not worth anything. And, you know, the uh, get the old uh, I'll slap you in the middle of next week type of, you know, feel. It, that's really what we see here from God. And again, in the past, usually there was a, there was a response, and oftentimes it's just a discussion between God and Moses. Well, I'll do this for them. Now, it doesn't look like there's any interaction. God just sends fiery serpents in to start uh, attacking and, and killing the people. Uh, the Lord sent fiery serpents. They bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. So they came to their senses. You know, there's fiery serpents have a way of, of getting your attention. It says, Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a broad serpent, and set it on a pole, and the serp if, if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So uh, they, they came to their senses. They had an uh, uh, opportunity to repent. And so God gave this very, very unconventional thing. Um, if you, if you uh, look at most hospitals, and I remember when I was in Boy Scouts, we had first aid kit we tra uh, 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 had, and it usually had a little snake bite kit in it. But when you open up the snake bite kit, there wasn't a little bronze serpent in there. So that, you know, if you get brought, bit by a rattlesnake, well, here, just look at this, and everything's going to be okay. You know, if you, if you get bit uh, by uh, a rattlesnake or a uh, cottonmouth or something, and, and they take you down to UAB or one of the other trauma centers, there's not a bronze serpent hanging in the ER. So that, okay, you look at it, you're going to be fine. And one of the things that, that made this work, it wasn't, the power was not in the bronze serpent itself. But it was in obedience to God who commanded that this is the way in this situation to take care of these deadly snake bites. And in God fulfilling his promise that if they were bitten and if they looked at the serpent, then they would be healed. So the power was not in the broad serpent. And it's, it's kind of... Uh, Interesting that, that we see uh, this, this illustration here. And we're going to come back to it here uh, in just a moment. Because uh, I want to I go over to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. And I want to talk about the temple. And then I'll bring these, these things together uh, in just a moment. In 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon has uh, built uh, the temple. And as he is dedicating the temple in, in prayer, and uh, I'm just going to read se uh, several things out of 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 20. Now the Lord has fulfilled, this is Solomon talking, Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise he made, for I have risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, and there I have provided a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now notice what he says in verse 27. 
But, and, and dedicating it, he's speaking to the people. He said, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard for the prayer of your servant and his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place which you have said by name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place and listen in heaven your dwelling place and when you hear, forgive. In verse 35, he says, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain because you have sinned against you, if they pray toward this place, acknowledge your name and turn from your sins when you afflict them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. When you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain on the land which you have given to your people as an inheritance. Down in verse 44, he says, if your people go out into battle against their enemy, by whatever way you shall send them. And they pray to the Lord towards the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name. Then hear in heaven and uh, their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. And if they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to an enemy so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors saying we have sinned and acted, acted perversely and wickedly if they repent with all their mind and with their, all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive and pray to you toward their land which you gave their fathers the city that you have chosen the house that I have built for your name then here in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you, and all their transgressions they have committed against you, and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. And so we see that when this temple is built, the presence of God is manifest in this temple. In verse 10, of 1 Kings chapter 8, it says, When the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. So the priest could not stand to minister uh, because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. We had uh, preached a sermon on that not long ago. The glory of the Lord filled the temple, and there was no room for the priest to serve for a time. So the presence of God was manifest there in the temple. As Solomon noted, this was not God's house on earth in the sense that now, like the pagan gods, he had a place to live. But rather, he manifested himself there in the middle of uh, this land to be with his people in the midst of their land. And so uh, he had this promise that, that was made that, that his presence would be there. So if they prayed towards that temple that he would hear them in times of need or when they would cry out for forgiveness and they would cry towards the temple, then God would hear. And so one of the things you have to recognize is that the power was not in the temple itself. It wasn't in the wood or in the stone or in the gold or anything that physically made up the temple, no matter how precious it was and the precious stones that were involved, the power was not in the building itself. We find a situation where in response to uh, what Solomon promised here in Daniel chapter 6 and also implied in Daniel chapter 9, in fact, if you want to go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 9, that Daniel understood this promise When he offered a prayer of forgiveness on uh, behalf of the people. In Daniel chapter 6, we know the, the story of the lion's den. That Daniel played, prayed several times a day towards Jerusalem. The reason why he's praying towards Jerusalem was because of this instruction of, of Solomon. 
He's in the land of his captors, and he's praying to God. He's praying towards Jerusalem. In Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 3, there is a prayer of for, uh, uh, forgiveness. Uh, and it's it, the reason why you think, well, Daniel, why haven't you prayed this prayer of forgiveness before this time? You could have saved us a lot of captivity because the result of the prayer in Daniel chapter 9 is an angel being sent that the steps are now being made for your release. But the reason why Daniel, even when he was praying uh, before and praying uh, when he's in Babylon, it wasn't the time of their release. And if you notice in the first part of Daniel, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years, this is verse 2, that according to the word of the Lord by the Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So there were 70 years that were predicted that Jerusalem would be uh, in, in basically a state of destruction. Uh, Jeremiah said, in basically in repayment for all the, the uh, Sabbaths that, that they had ignored and, and uh, the, all the Passovers, the, the fact that they had ignored God and, and these feast days. And so he says, 70 years are appointed for your people. And so he says, I've calculated, and, and it's that 70-year <laughs> period. And so Daniel, and starting in verse 3, I turn my face to the Lord God. And that, it, that, that sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? It's like, well, well God's everywhere. You know, we tell that to, to our uh, kids. We say, well, God's everywhere. He's, he's not this way or that way. He's, he's all around us. Well, we understand from the context of what Solomon had said before, he's turned, and <clears throat> what we see in Daniel chapter 6, he's facing Jerusalem. He's facing where the temple was. I turn my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I pray to the Lord and make confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and your rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke, into your, spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. And then he goes on to praise God for his might and his righteousness and his greatness. <clears throat> and notice in verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity he has brought upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made a name for yourself as this day we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O oh Lord, according to your all, all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy hill, because of our sins, for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, and your people have become a byword among the, all who are around us. Now therefore, O oh God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy, and for your own sake, O oh Lord, make your face shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear, O oh Lord, forgive, O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. We see this prayer, this very heartful, uh, heartfelt, deep prayer of Daniel. And he's praying towards the desolated uh, ruins of the temple in the desolation of the city of Jerusalem. Not because he thinks there's something magical about their foundation. You know, sometimes you'll see uh, these... Uh, these kids' movies and sometimes Disney movies. They look, 
uh, looks like everything's bad, but there's just this little fragment of something that was once magical in it, and it lights up, and it's got just a little bit of power left in it, and they're able to use it, and they're able to do so. It's not like, you know, he's figured maybe there's just enough stones of the temple that are piled together that there's just one last little bit of magic in that old temple to bring us back. His confidence is not in the temple. His confidence is in the God who, who was manifest in that place that it's in obedience to the God who commanded Solomon to build that temple and to the God who brought them into captivity. And God fulfilling his promise to them that he would forgive their iniquities when they prayed towards this place. And that if they were truly repentant, that he would bring them back. That he would heal them spiritually. And so we find that Daniel is exhibiting a faith in the God that was behind that temple that was in ruins. Of a city that was in ruins. Because he knew the power of the God who had commanded the temple to be built in the first place. Before this time, and, and he alludes to it in his prayer, that we didn't listen to the prophets. That talked to the kings, that talked to our nobles, the, the rulers, and talked to all the common people. And, and, and uh, no one listened. And one of the things that we find, if we study through that period, is that Israel became very superstitious. And they began to trust in the objects themselves and not God behind the objects. You know what's interesting? In, in 2 Kings uh, chapter uh, 18 and verse 4, in 2 Kings uh, chapter 18 and verse 4, when uh, in, in one of the periods of renewal and restoration in the land, and in 2 Kings chapter 18, as, as Hezekiah is going and, and purifying the land, verse 4, he removes the high places, he broke the pillars, and he cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze servant that Moses has made, for until those days the people have made offerings to him. And it was called the Hushtan. They got to the point that this bronze serpent that was created for a purpose, that they began to worship the bronze serpent itself. The power was never in the serpent. It was in the God who commanded Moses to, to uh, make the serpent and the promise that at that time, that if they were bitten, that they could look at it and live. That was the only power that that bronze serpent had. And yet it became something that they worshipped. The temple also, and we won't turn there, but in Jeremiah chapter 7, it gets to the point that there's this proverb that in the land, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. And, and the idea is that the that any time the prophets would talk about, well, Babylon's going to come in and destroy Jerusalem, they're like, that's not going to happen. Look, the temple of the Lord's here. God's not going to allow his, his temple to be destroyed. Whereas the prophets were saying, oh yeah, God, God is going to allow not only his temple, but this city, to, all of it to be laid waste, and you're going to be carried into captivity based on what he said, said to Moses and what the prophets have been warning you about. Just because this temple exists in the midst of your city, in all the glory in which Solomon built it, the power is not in those bricks. The power is not on that gold that is overlaid, the precious wood and those precious stones. It has no power at all. And they were trusting in the temple itself instead of the God <clears throat> whose presence was manifest in the temple, the God who commanded that temple to be built. And the promises that came to those who prayed to God, not to those who prayed to the temple. And I, th I think it's important because sometimes, uh, you know, we, I think we've got to be careful as well that we don't fall into some of the same type of superstitions that we find with them. I, I've had discussions before, and maybe you have as well, <coughs> where... 
uh, you talk to someone about how they're living, and they say, well, I was baptized. Well, what does baptism do? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, verse is probably familiar to, to many of you in the comparison of baptism to um, uh, the, the ark that was prepared for the saving of Noah. Baptism corresponds to this, what he's talking about with this ark. Baptism now saves you, not the removal of the dirt of the body, but the appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, so baptism saves you. It's not the physical cleansing of your skin, but rather what does that baptism represent? What does it do? And I think, I think as Sam described this morning, it is the sinner's prayer. It is the sinner's appeal to God that our sins be washed away. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, Romans 6, starting in verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him, with him by baptism into death, that in order as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might walk in newness of life. The baptism is this way that we, we die with Christ and then we're raised to walk in a new life. It's not something that just happens to us and that we can point it back to us and go live how we want to live. We come out with a new life where it's not I who lives, it's Christ lives in me. It's not about the things that I want to do to please myself, but what can I do to please God? In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So through baptism, we put on Christ. We die to our old self. We're raised to walk in a new life. We put on Christ. Acts 2 and verse uh, 38, uh, we, we often uh, quote it from the Sermon of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we see these promises that come with the baptism. And uh, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 with Paul, uh, when um, uh, Ananias comes to him, he says, why, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how we call on God for forgiveness. It's through baptism. It's not in the power of the water. It's, it's not in, you know, that, that we have special water here. It's not like we, we fill the baptistry and then Sam has a special prayer. And then once he prays that special prayer, the water magically changed and there's something different about it. It's just regular water. We could go out to a pool. We could go out to a lake. We could go out to another sufficient body of water. And it is, it is good for the purpose. And so <clears throat> the power is not in the water. The power is in the obedience to God who commanded it. The baptism. God is where the power is. And God fulfilling his promise to forgive and cleanse and adopt those who are baptized for the remission of the sins. Just like we see there with the temple. God say, look, it's not the power in the temple. It's the power of the God behind the temple. And it's the same thing with baptism. It's not the water. It's the power in the God who commands it. And the God who says, by promise, people want to know, how can I know if I'm saved? Because I can read the promises of God. I don't have to go with some feeling because my feelings are, are, are unreliable. I have felt really good about some bad things, and I've really felt bad about some good things that I needed to do. I can't trust my feelings. But I can trust the promises of God. God says, you did this, and you did it for this reason. You did it in this way. Okay, well, you have my promise. You know, when Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, he got the benefit of when he said the prayer towards Jerusalem, an angel came to him and said, as soon as your prayer started, I was sent to bring you the message that God is, is, has heard your prayer and he's starting the process uh, of your return. But not everybody who prayed the prayer toward the temple you know, got an angelic response that your message has been heard and here's what's being done. But we can trust because we know the promises that are made. 
You know, when Jesus was on his ministry, we, we see another uh, area of potential danger. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, when Peter made the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, he says, upon this confession, I will build my church. And when we look at Acts chapter 2, starting in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, we see those who received the word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Added to what? They were added to the church. They were added to the body of believers. Verse 47, the Christians were praising God, having favor on people, and the Lord had added to their number day by day those who were being saved. In chapter 5 and verse 14, Chapter 5 and verse 14. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So we see that as people are being converted, they're added to the number. They're added to uh, the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, I think, you know, I've always liked this description of the church. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. <coughs> Paul writes to Timothy, if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the buttress of truth. It's, a, it's the household of God. It's, it's a castle of truth. <laughs> it is uh, the church of the living God. And we can re read in the, the uh, first part of uh, Ephesians and also Colossians that it, there again is called the body of of Jesus, that the church is God's, uh, is Christ's body, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 9, we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. According to the grace that God has been given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how he builds. And this conclusion, verse 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. God's temple is holy and you are that temple. And so um, Paul will use temple in two ways. One is to describe us as a temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells, but also in this context, it's the church in which the, the Spirit <coughs> dwells. And so uh, we see here that the church is the body of Christ. It is the temple of God. It is the pillar, the, the buttress or the ground of the truth that Jesus established into which baptized believers are added. And one of the things that if we parallel it back to what we, we read uh, about the temple, the power is not that when you know, you go down to the Southfield Church of Christ and there's a directory in the back and you open up and you'll find I'm listed there. Or any other directory. And so you, you can find my name in the directory and therefore I'm okay with God. We, we actually, I think, have a, a note in the directory that says, you know, just because you're listed in here doesn't <laughs> necessarily mean, uh, uh, I don't know that it says doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't uh, mean anything as far as your relationship, you know, between God or whether you're even, uh, you know, considered a member. You know, we, uh, the church, the power is not in this building, and we understand that the church is not the building, the, the church is the people. And yet, sometimes people can take a rather superstitious view of the church, either as a whole or as the local church, and say, well, you know, I attend there on a regular basis, and therefore, I'm okay. Every, everything's fine. The power is not in the local church here with the sign in front of it, but rather, just like with the temple, it's by being obedient as this church, us individually, and the things we do as a church, as we are obedient to Christ who built this church, who bought this church, who shed his blood to purify this church, 
to live, as we talked about this morning, zealous for good works, knowing that God's going to fulfill his promise to save his church eternally. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and talking about the resurrection. That all things have to be under the feet of Christ until he turns the church back over to the Father. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26. Again, we, we can become superstitious about certain things. Uh, we can be superstitious uh, about baptism. I live an unfaithful life, but you know I was baptized. Not only was I baptized, but you know, brother so-and-so, he does meetings all over the nation. He's the one who baptized me. doesn't matter who, who baptized. The power is not that you went under water one time. Are you obedient to the God who commanded baptism? Are you trusting in the promises of of God who commanded that. Our confidence is not that we're a member of some church, but that we're obedient to God. In fact, we can spend time in the book of Revelation and see, uh, in fact, if we go over to Revelation chapter 2, uh, Revelation chapter 2, Here as Jesus is moving among the churches, <clears throat> Revelation chapter two, verse four. I have this, this against you that you abandon the love that you had at first. Therefore, remember from which you have fallen, <clears throat> and repent. Do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. I'm going to remove your identity with me from its place unless you repent. He has some good things to say to him, but he says you need to repent. Chapter three. Chapter 3, to the church of Sardis, <clears throat> he says, I know your works, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Verse 2, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you've received and heard, keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will know, not know what hour I come against you. Even here at Sardis, he goes on to say, there's a few who haven't soiled their garments. They, they'll be there with me, but just because you're with them doesn't mean that you're going to be with me. They'll be with me because they have remained faithful to me. He says, unless you repent, you're not going to be with me. But we're, but we're members of the church of Sardis. We're, we've got Sardis Church of Christ on the front. We have two meetings a year. we got two preachers. Doesn't matter. Those of you who haven't so, so soiled your garments, you will be with me. But, but those of you who haven't, you, you won't. Verse 15. The most famous church of these letters is the church of Laodicea. Verse 15. I know your work. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So you were lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I'll spit you out of my mouth. For you say I'm rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. <clears throat> not realizing that you were Wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments that you may clothe yourselves. And the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. They forgot their God. They forgot to be obedient to their God. They forgot to put their trust in the promises of God. 1 Corinthians 11, when talking about the Lord's Supper, Paul <coughs> tells, tells him, he says, look, you're not coming together to do this for the right reason. And then he begins to correct their error. So, so we can be on a church roll or in a church directory and yet not be pleasing to him. So, so we can't get superstitious about one day I was baptized or I'm in the directory and I'm considered a member of such and such church. Where is our trust? Just as Israel began to trust the serpent instead of the God behind the serpent, they began to trust 
the temple instead of the God behind the temple. We've got to trust God and our Savior that's behind, that commanded that baptism and upon whom those promises were given. And the church that was established by Jesus, that was bought by Jesus, purified by Jesus, be obedient to him and trusting in those promises. You know, one last thing that, just very quickly, when I was going through it, Kings and Chronicles are parallel, and you can go ahead and turn to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 16. The other thing that we can kind of put our trust in, there's supposed to put our trust in, Sam alluded to it, I think, a little bit, uh, either the class or sermon, maybe a little both, is our past. I love that prayer of Solomon. Like I said, I'm going to do it a lesson on it at some point. I preached on different parts of it for different things. <clears throat> It'd be nice if you could kind of close Kings right there. Solomon did some great things. But as you can continue reading in Solomon, Solomon who built that incredibly beautiful temple, that there are chapters that are devoted to the craftsmanship of Hiram and his servants and the precision of the work that they did and the beauty of the materials. And, and I, was, I was amazed, I thought about this time, <clears throat> this very rare and important wood that was used um, from the north. There was also later some, some wood that was imported uh, that, that was only ever used there. And they covered it in gold. You know, a lot of times you think you're, you're going to just cover something, anything, you know, grab some, go grab some pine or whatever, no matter, nobody's going to see it. Even, even that which was overlaid and, and covered was still precious. And he, he, he made that wonderful prayer to which Daniel appealed to in the midst of their captivity. Solomon also had some other building projects. Built himself a great house. Built some uh, fortresses and other things for the protection of Israel. But as you go through Kings, he also built places to worship idols. Because it said that he loved many foreign women. And these women had their idolatrous gods and instead of giving them up Solomon picked their gods up and he built uh, places for the abomination of Chemosh and the abomination of Molech and those are the words in the book of Kings and in his old age he had the wisdom of God and so I said one of the points that, that, that makes towards uh, in, in, in Kings, First Kings, is that one of the reasons God was angry was he talked to him twice. When he, when he became king and he gave him wisdom, divine wisdom, and then after he finished the temple and said, look, if you keep my word, they will no, never fail to sit on the throne of descendant of David, you and your sons. God talked to him twice. He had divine wisdom that was beyond what, what we could even imagine happened. And yet he acted so foolishly. He did a lot of great things in his past. And another one is Asa. You read Asa's story in 1 Kings, it's pretty good because he talks about all the, the great reforms he did. He even uh, deposed the queen mother because she was bringing idolatry in. So, sorry, mom, you're gone. You don't have any place of authority here. And he went through and he purified the land. And it said, as, as First Kings tells it, that he got diseased in his feet towards the end of his life and then he died. You think, oh, poor Asa. But boy, thanks for everything that you did in that reign. But in Second Chronicles chapter 16, Second Chronicles also talks about Asa's diseased feet. And in the last years, 
of Asa's reign, where Asa took silver and gold from the house of the Lord, and he sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, to appeal to him. And uh, in, in his conflict with Israel. Verse 7, Hananiah the seer came to Asa the king of Judah and said, Because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Syria has escaped you. We're, and he's talking now about battles they had in their past. Were not the Ethiopians and Libyans a huge army with many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hands. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this. From now on, you will have wars. And so Asa was angry with the seer, or the prophet, and put him in stocks in the prison, for he was enraged with him because of what he said, the message of God. And Asa inflicted cruelties upon some of the people at the same time. The Acts of Asa, they're written in the books of the kings of Judah. In the 39th year, verse 12, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. And he slept from his father, dying in the 41st year of his reign. And don't read it wrong. It's not saying it's, it's wrong to go see the doctor. Don't, don't interpret that wrong. But the point is, he, was, he would not seek God for this problem, for help with this problem. He would only keep going after all the physicians, trying to find somebody who could help with, when there was a God who would be able to heal him if God wanted him. Asa wouldn't do. Asa's another one that you read so much of his history. Like, wow, this is great. Judah needed a king like this. And then towards the end of his life, somewhere along the way, his trust in God falters. He starts trusting in the kings around him for defense instead of trusting in God like he did when he was younger. And gets angry at God's messengers for telling him what he needs to hear. And then finally getting so stubborn when he's got this problem that God can take care of, that he would be humble and turn to him or at least be strengthened. He becomes obstinate. We can't trust in our past, do we? We can live a faithful and wonderful life turn from God towards the end because we fail to uh, remember to be obedient to the God who's promised us so many things if we'll be faithful unto death if we'll be faithful all the days of our lives and that when we sin that we will repent and we will turn back But I did this in my past. Oh, I, you know, I was, a, I was one of the founding members of this particular church. Or I was one of the people who was very involved in this kind of, doesn't matter. If in the end, you turn away from God. The road may be hard. The road may be long. The road may be difficult. But don't, don't give up. Not until the time where you, your last breath is over, then you can go to that reward. I like the song of invitation number 310, I am thine, O Lord. If you're not God's, you have that opportunity to talk about baptism in this. To come to the Father through Jesus Christ, turning from your sins, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, being baptized, your sins will be washed away, not because you'll have this good feeling about it, not because some magical light will, will appear or whatever, or you'll hear some voice, but because based on the promises of God that we read in the Scriptures, God says, if you do this, I will forgive you. And you continue to live that obedient life, that trusting life in Him, being a faithful part of His body all the days of your life. And then times when you're weak, times that you're far, that you turn back to Him, plead for His, his forgiveness, and in His mercy and His kindness, He will give it to you. Just have to be invitation in any way at all. Please let it be made known while we stand.